Thank you, Rob, for that introduction. Can folks hear me OK? OK. Is it, I don't hear the echo, but I guess um, the sound is good. Um, if at any point uh, my voice gets low, just throw up your hand. Um, you all feel so far away. If we had more time, I would ask you to come closer. But um, I guess we'll just work with this. And maybe um, towards the end, maybe we'll move up or, or just stay the same. So um, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon, uh, as many of you know. Uh, I did my graduate work here, and it's always uh, a very uh, enjoyable to come back uh, and to have an excuse to come to Ann Arbor um, and share my research. So I'm very glad to uh, be with you here today. Um, the work that I'm going to be presenting is a, not a traditional research talk. So instead of um, zeroing in on fine details of particular studies, um, I'm going to summarize um, a body of work that we've done um, in the area of racial identity research. Uh, and there's a new problem that I've stumbled upon um, in trying to understand um, how racial identity operates um, in the context of racial discrimination um, and mental health. And I'm actually hoping um, that you will be able to help me uh, figure out what may be going on uh, with this kind of uh, newer finding that we're, we're uh, finding in our data. So um, that's the plan for today. Um, this is just a brief agenda um, of what you can expect. I'm going to start out just uh, laying a little bit of um, the background and motivation um, for the work that we're focusing on today. Um, I'll briefly tell you a little bit about my program of research um, and some interesting findings that are uh, relevant to uh, race, wealth, and health disparities. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then, as I said before, I really want to uh, spend some time talking about um, a number of studies, four or five studies that we've published um, on the uh, role of racial identity uh, for African American uh, young adults in particular. Uh, and then after that, I'd like to have a discussion, sort of talk about uh, what these findings may mean, where we go from here. Um, and again, I'm hoping that you all will, will kind of help me uh, with that. Okay. So, why racism? Um, why study it in the context of health? Um, this has been a, co a concept that I've been interested in for a very long time. Uh, some of it is, uh, has to do with my own lived experience um, as a black male in the US. Um, but, um, you know, I, just to give you a little bit of a personal background, um, up until about seventh grade, I was um, in predominantly monoracial context. Uh, and in seventh grade, my parents moved me to 
a uh, private school that was uh, majority white. I was one of the few black kids. Um, and I started to have these things called encounter experiences. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with Bill Cross's racial identity model, he argues that um, individuals are not thinking very deeply about race. And then something happens. There's kind of a catalytic or jolting moment uh, where um, they start to realize that something's different. Um, and so I had a lot of encounter moments um, as a, a young black seventh grader. Um, the first one was going into a stationery store um, and the shop owner uh, followed me around the store in sort of a menacing way um, and kicked me out of the store. Um, and I remember um, feeling, you know, sort of, um, you know, embarrassed that this happened. I didn't tell my parents about it. Um, I didn't understand why this had happened, um, so on and so forth. And I went on to have a number of these experiences um, as I went through um, the independent school I attended um, and also at, at Brown University um, where I did my undergrad. Uh, while I was at Brown, a very interesting thing happened, and that was that I realized there was a scholarship around um, racism, that people were studying racial discrimination experiences, uh, and I learned about uh, racial identity and these different theories like Cross and Finney, um, and I got really excited about um, the idea that racial identity could be a resilience factor um, or a factor that protects or mitigates um, the negative impact um, of racial discrimination. I started to think about that in the context of my own experiences. Um, and so that's kind of what uh, sort of a personal um, foundation for um, thinking about this work. Uh, we know that racism has been in the headlines quite a bit uh, in the last years. It feels like every week there's a new headline. Um, here are some that I took. Uh, this was a uh, post at the end of the 2018 where they were talking about use experiences of living while black. Um, actually, I take that back. It wasn't use experiences, it was just uh, living while black. And most of the examples were adults. Um, but from the list, I was able to call a number of experiences that happened to youth. Um, you know, selling water, a little girl selling water, a woman calling the police on her. Um, there was this young nine year old boy here who. Um, you know, was accused of inappropriate touching, uh, but it later became clear from uh, video footage that um, his backpack had accidentally um, touched um, a, a woman who was in the store. And so, um, for, fortunately, that video footage occurred. Otherwise, um, the, the, the situation would have been a little bit different. Um, for those of you who um, did not see the last event, this happened, I think, around December or January. There was an incident where this is a biracial youth um, was asked to um, cut his dreads in order to continue or participate um, in the wrestling match. And so it seems that uh, while these incidents have been going on for a long time, um, the number and sheer frequency with which we're aware that they are taking place um, is something that's been on the rise um, and increase. So this is kind of popular culture, sort of everyday um, sorts of things. While all of this is going on, we also know that there's scholarly interest in this topic. So um, there have been a plethora of special issues um, focused on um, racism and health uh, in the last couple of years, some done by uh, folks here. Uh, there's also, um, earlier this year, in cultural diversity and ethnic minority psychology, um, there was another special issue. I encourage you to check it out if you haven't taken a look, which focused on uh, racism and health disparities, and thinking about how um, behavioral and, uh, behavioral and um, psychological researchers um, can really think about being a part of the conversation on racial health disparities. Um, for a long time, it's been sort of something that's thought of as um, sort of public health concern, but how do we bring psychological and behavioral uh, researchers uh, into the fold? Um, and so um, that's a, yet another example of a special issue um, around this topic. Okay, many of you in this room would not be surprised to know that there is a, uh, just a litany of studies at this point um, that show that racial discrimination um, is linked to um, a number of negative health outcomes. If you think of a negative health outcome, there's probably been a study, unfortunately, um, linking racial discrimination or racism-related stress um, to those outcomes. Um, in terms of the larger demographics I mentioned, 
um, the headlines that we've seen lately. Um, but we also know that this is a significant topic because of um, changing demographics. So we know that by next year, um, the majority of uh, the youth population will be um, majority minority, so to speak. Um, we know that by 2043 or 2044, this will be true of the adult population as well. Um, so that's an important um, dynamic that we want to pay attention to in terms of the significance. Um, the Southern Poverty Law Center um, has talked about the rise of white nationalism and how um, there's been an uptick uh, in uh, white nationalist ideology. And so um, if we want to pay attention to the well-being and health um, of African-American racial and ethnic minority youth, and I would and, uh, argue all youth, uh, we want to sort of pay attention to um, this changing uh, societal trend as well. Um, sort of concurrent with the rise in white nationalism, um, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, are also a rise in hate crimes. And we've seen, um, unfortunately, in headlines recently, um, an uptick in those as well. Um, there have been a number of concerns around changes in U.S. Justice Department policy um, with ICE um, and um, not just immigrant populations, um, but also thinking about sort of a return to zero tolerance um, policies um, that were problematic um, in the latter part of the, the 20th century. So these are some of the societal trends and, and reasons that the topic is significant. Uh, one of the things I've been interested in for a long time is understanding the pathways by which racism-related stress leads to um, health difficulties. Um, this is one of my quote-unquote favorite, if that word can be used in this context, uh, papers by David Williams um, and Selena Muhammad, um, really thinking about um, what direction um, do we need to go in with respect to um, this uh, research. Um, and in fact, um, just to give you a sense of the inner <laughs> workings of my brain, uh, and some of the studies you'll see today come from this. Um, and when I read this paper in 2009, um, I was in the early stages of my career at UNC, and so I wrote down all the different research questions that um, David Williams said um, are important and that we need to do research on and set out over the next couple of years to do um, a longitudinal study um, that would um, sort of address all the questions. So all the things he said, we don't have uh, you know, sort of answers about internalized racism, we don't have answers about coping. I put it into one big study and um, I have a lot of pilot data on these different things um, that I've been using um, over the years. Much of it I won't talk about today, but I'm kind of thinking about what are the underlying pathways um, by which we get from racism-related stress um, to these. And one of the questions um, that Williams and Muhammad raised at the end of their paper is the second question that you see here. So um, what are personal um, and situational factors that affect the underlying processes? Um, one personal factor that I've been particularly interested in um, that David did not mention um, is racial identity. So thinking about the personal um, significance um, and meaning of race um, to individuals um, and trying to have some sense of how that plays out in terms of the effect um, of race-related stress on people's um, mental health. Okay, so a couple of slides just on theory to um, orient you to how I think about um, this topic. This is a well-known model uh, by uh, Rodney Clark and colleagues from the late 90s, biopsychosocial model of stress, uh, of racism, sorry, that uses a stress and coping framework. And um, Clark and colleagues argued that part of the way that we understand the link between racism and health is that once one perceives discrimination, it leads to exaggerated psychological and physiological responses. And that over time, these kind of exaggerated psychological and physiological responses um, lead to um, poor health outcomes, okay? Uh, that was the basic premise or basic concept. In addition, Clark and colleagues said, uh, there are a lot of different factors that influence uh, whether once something is perceived as a stressor, a race-related stressor, um, it ends up becoming uh, a health issue, okay? And so again, there are these different um, constitutional factors, sociodemographic factors, um, and psychological factors. 
um, that may play a role in kind of moderating, um, again, whether um, the perception of discrimination leads to um, poor health. Okay, more recently, um, David again, um, with um, Selena Mohammed, um, have published um, sort of a framework for thinking about um, how racism affects health. Uh, one of the things I've been increasingly interested in, um, although you won't hear as much about it today, is how we pay a lot of attention to interpersonal instances of discrimination, um, but Williams and Muhammad and many other scholars have argued for a long time that um, that's probably the least of our worries, that we really need to um, pay a lot of attention to the institutional and cultural factors, um, and that those things sort of play out um, and lead to um, you know, these disparities in uh, morbidity, mortality, disability, et cetera. Um, as psychologists, which is, and I'm trained as a clinical psychologist, uh, we have tended to focus on the individual and interpersonal level. Um, that's what we know how to do best. Um, and we are kind of stuck on how do we begin to get at kind of the, the structural um, and cultural levels. And so uh, we may talk about that later, but I'm beginning to think about um, borrowing and collaborating with folks outside of psychology who um, have done some very elegant thinking about um, how we look at those kinds of things. Okay, um, one other framework um, that I want to mention here that's going to become very relevant as we have a discussion later is thinking about the mechanisms of protection. So um, there have been a number of studies that argue um, that ethnic identity, racial identity is a good thing. There have been a number of studies that say that socialization, how folks talk to their kids about race can mitigate the negative effects of discrimination. So we know that um, parents who um, and, you know, give racial pride messages, parents who uh, take their kids to activities that center around culture, um, that seems to be protective in the context of discrimination. Um, cultural orientation is another one that's been um, sort of articulated both for children of African descent as well as um, you know, other racial and ethnic minority youth, um, so um, values like familismo, for example, and other um, cultural values that seem to protect um, youth against um, the effects of discrimination. What's been less clear is how those things work. How do we get from positive racial identity or ethnic identity to favorable mental health outcomes? How do we get from socialization? What's happening? And as someone who's interested in developing interventions um, or programming that's actually going to address youth, um, I have argued that the basic science research, and this point will become extremely clear as I continue my talk, um, is really important to understand the underlying mechanisms and processes. Because if you don't understand the underlying mechanisms or processes, it's kind of hard to um, sort of proceed blindly uh, with interventions. People do it, but um, I've argued, and again, I think the data I'll show you today um, sort of suggests that we need to really do some careful thinking about what the mechanisms are um, that are at play, okay? So um, I have argued that some of the ways that um, racial identity, socialization, and cultural orientation are beneficial are that they, oops, um, improve people's sense of self-concept, um, that they um, sort of affect how you perceive or appraise the world around you, um, and that they have um, implications for coping strategies, okay? Now, some of you may be sitting here thinking, okay, that, that makes sense, uh, that seems pretty obvious, but there's strikingly little empirical work um, that has really taken a look at the mechanisms um, or processes by which these things um, operate, okay? Um, and the mechanistic work that does exist, um, most of it is cross-sectional research. So um, it's really hard to get a sense of um, how these processes play out um, over time uh, with respect to the, the underlying mechanisms. Okay. All right, so I just want to say a couple of words um, about uh, my program of research. You heard uh, you know, a little bit earlier in terms of focusing on racism and health. Um, as I've said uh, before, um, I've been interested in the link between uh, racism uh, and health um, with a primary focus on racial discrimination. 
Um, I trained as a clinical psychologist, so I started out really paying attention to um, clinical symptoms, um, depressive symptoms, anxiety, um, those sorts of things. Um, eventually that morphed to thinking about kind of well-being and wellness more generally. And then in our most recent work, uh, we are thinking about um, how these uh, links, uh, particularly the psychological factors, um, not only play a role in psychological or mental health, but also physical health outcomes, okay? Because, you know, when you look at the epidemiological data uh, for uh, mental health disorders, um, that's not where you see the disparities. In fact, African Americans are on par, but it's really the physical health disparities. And so one of the questions for me became, how can I, as a psychologist, contribute to our understanding of the psychological piece of these disparities that we see in blood pressure, in cardiovascular health, in uh, DHEA, uh, and in telomere length, et cetera. Um, and so that's been a, a newer, more recent area. Um, to the work, I bring a resilience perspective. Um, and that is, I was talking with someone about this earlier this morning, um, if you were only to study racism and health, you could get depressed very quickly. And somebody said, how do you, how do you keep going uh, with you know, this topic? Don't you get depressed? And I said, well, um, one thing that helps me is thinking about uh, resilience and protective factors and understanding what are the assets and resources that you have that allow them to uh, you know, sort of uh, negotiate experience of discrimination and still um, end up uh, with favorable health outcomes, even despite the experience of discrimination. So uh, one sort of unique element, although I'm certainly not the only one to look at uh, racial identity socialization, is really thinking about what are the racial and cultural assets um, that youth have. Um, there's a lot of work that focuses on social support and family resources and, and things of that nature, and that work is important, um, but I have been particularly interested, and I think that a key to really bolstering uh, the youth, the health of youth of African descent um, has to be that the, um, we take into account um, their race and their culture and the significance and meaning of race to their self-concepts. Um, and that if you don't consider those factors, you're not going to get as far. Hey, because we argue it's an empirical question, uh, but that's, that's kind of the belief that I've operated under. Um, so again, you see some of the things that we've looked at there. Okay, so um, a couple of highlights uh, from the program of research. Um, I want to just mention really quickly um, a study we did a few years ago um, looking at gender and socioeconomic status. Uh, so um, we did a study where uh, we were looking at the link between um, discrimination and psychological distress. Uh, and, you know, there have been a number of studies that have kind of looked at gender as a moderator, a number of studies that have looked at uh, socioeconomic status as a moderator. Um, we kind of went in uh, with some loose expectations that the association between discrimination um, and psychological distress would be stronger for um, folks from lower socioeconomic backgrounds because of the additional stressors, kind of stress proliferation theory. Um, that it's not just discrimination, but in the context of other stressors, that would really, you know, kind of rev things up. Uh, we went into it with the premise that um, the link would be stronger because of the work on um, internalizing problems um, for um, young women in our sample. These were 18-year-olds, um, uh, first-year students um, at UNC. Uh, what we actually found in this study was a, a three-way interaction, um, and surprisingly, the strongest association between um, discrimination um, and psychological distress was actually in um, the African-American female students. In fact, uh, I don't have a, a plot of the chart, but uh, when you looked at high levels of discrimination, um, they had uh, the highest levels of psychological distress. Anxiety symptoms, depressive symptoms uh, were off the chart. Um, you did not see the same pattern for um, African-American women from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, and interestingly, you know, when you looked at the um, young men in our sample, so again, 18-year-old males, um, there was no link between discrimination um, and uh, psychological distress in the 
young men from higher SES backgrounds. So this really caused us to pause for a little bit and think about um, the kind of intersection um, of these different identities um, and why would it be the case that for um, African American women uh, from higher SES backgrounds that um, th they would really be experiencing these high levels of distress. Um, we also found that for low SES young men, um, there was also a strong association between discrimination um, and psychological distress, but it was not at the level um, of the African American women um, who reported being from um, higher SES backgrounds. Um, and in that study, we measured SES looking at um, sort of maternal educational um, attainment. So in thinking about kind of straightforward patterns of health disparities and assuming that um, lower SES is always kind of the, um, you know, sort of highest vulnerability, um, obviously um, we need to be a little bit more complex in our thinking there. Okay, a couple of the other studies I'm going to talk about um, when I get to the empirical data in a second. Um, we've done some work looking at different types of other resilience factors like res religious involvement, um, racial socialization. Um, I'm going to pull out all of the identity stuff in just a second, so we'll talk some more there. And then more recently, um, we've done some conceptual work. Here's the special issue um, that um, I really talked about what I see as kind of the next steps. Uh, I think I passed around the reading. I'm not sure if it got circulated. Um, it's a short piece, thought piece, on kind of the next steps in psychological and behavioral research uh, for racism and health. Um, and recently, another special issue that came out uh, this month in emerging adulthood, I also want to call your attention to that, uh, which was a piece thinking about the role of ethnic and racial identity um, from an interdisciplinary perspective. So, uh, you know, racial identity, ethnic identity has been conceptualized in a number of ways. Um, these studies kind of looked at the labels that people use, um, the labels that other people give them, self-labels. They looked at pan-ethnic um, versus, you know, sort of uh, more, um, you know, ethnic labels. Um, looked at the transition of these um, self-labels over time um, and how they relate to different outcomes. Um, really nice collection of papers, um, and so I would encourage you to uh, take a look at that. Okay, so that's just a little bit um, of what we've done. All right, so what I want to do now in terms of empirical data um, racial identity research. This is something I've been interested in uh, for a very long time. And I have four or five studies here that I want to share with you. As I mentioned at the top of the talk, I'm not going to go into um, very specific details um, in terms of the methods of these papers. If you want to look that up, I'm happy to answer questions uh, or, um, you know, uh, uh, answer questions that you may have. What I really want to focus on is the big picture um, kind of findings of the studies um, and this tension point, um, some conflict in the data you'll see as I move through them, um, that I'm trying to kind of wrap my brain around and I'd actually like to get your help in thinking about um, what may be going on, okay? So study number one is actually the first, my first publication <laughs> uh, with my mentor Rob Sellers uh, way back in uh, 2004. Um, in this paper, we were interested in understanding the protective role of, of racial identity um, in the context of uh, psychological health, okay? So um, just to give you some idea, um, the aim of the study was to look at how racial identity um, plays a role in construing um, and experiencing daily racial hassles, okay? And we had two very simple questions. Um, our, it, our, at that time, there was a question <laughs> about whether discrimination was associated with mental health outcomes. Um, so that was question number one. Um, and question two was, does racial centrality serve as a protective factor? Okay, so um, for those of you who are not familiar with Seller's model, does the significance of being African American um, matter? Um, folks argue that it might be a protective factor when you experience discrimination, okay? Um, I know most of you um, in here are familiar with centrality, but just to give one more example, if I say that I'm high race central, that means that being African American is, is very important to who I am, okay? People who have lower racial centrality 
um, it, it's less important to their self-concept. Okay, so that's centrality. Um, there's been a long history here. Uh, if you go back to the Clark Dahl studies uh, in terms of thinking about um, self-concept and racial identity and people arguing that there's a damaged self-concept. Um, so the, the, these ideas have been linked together conceptually for a long time. Um, and um, you know, fortunately, uh, we know that um, this notion of a damaged self-concept is, is, is problematic um, and that African-American youth do have um, positive self-concept. Um, in the study, as you might expect, we looked at racial discrimination experiences, um, we looked at racial identity, um, and we looked at, um, for our psychological adjustment measures, uh, depressive symptoms, stress, and anxiety. Okay, so pretty straightforward here. Okay, does racial centrality moderate this link between uh, daily racial hassles and subsequent mental health? Um, as you can see here, if you look at um, the line, for those who had high centrality, there's no association uh, between discrimination and mental health. So this pattern is, is sort of consistent with the idea that there's something about um, having race be central to your self-concept that mitigates uh, the effect of discrimination, okay? Uh, now what it is, uh, is something uh, we know a little bit less about. Uh, people have argued, as you saw in the conceptual model I showed you earlier, that it could have to do with bolstering self-concept. Um, sellers at the time argued that maybe people um, you know, sort of engage in more active coping when they experience discrimination, um, so on and so forth. Um, what you see here is that individuals who have um, low and moderate levels of centrality, um, there is a positive association between discrimination. Okay? So this is pretty much a, a well-established finding. Here I'm only showing you the data for anxiety, but uh, you know, when we looked at perceived stress, um, when we looked at um, depressive symptoms, we found um, a very similar uh, pattern. Okay. All right, so study one, uh, that was um, race centrality. Um, one thing I should mention here is that these were longitudinal data. Um, so we're actually looking at uh, racial discrimination at the beginning of the student's first year um, and then uh, uh, their um, psychological symptoms at the end of the first year. Okay. Uh, one detail, I didn't know this as a student, um, in this paper we did not control for the initial levels of um, uh, psychological symptoms, okay? So um, that may have been a consideration uh, here in this paper um, as we see some of the other findings. Okay, all right, so uh, towards the end of graduate school, I was reading a lot of stuff in the racial health disparities uh, literature, um, and I said, okay, I, th I think we know that um, racial identity is protective in the context of psychological health. Um, I began to ask myself, um, is it possible that these same psychological factors like racial identity could also be protective in the context of physical health outcomes? So maybe there was something protective about this self-concept um, and having a sense, a strong sense of blackness um, that would also protect people in terms of their blood pressure uh, and cardiovascular outcomes. Uh, part of me was thinking, Gosh, when I look at the racial health disparities literature, this is where it is. Like, people are dying, life expectancy. Wouldn't it be great if these same factors that seem to be protective in the context of mental health um, also would extend to physical health, okay? So um, off I went to um, Howard University where I did a postdoc for two years with uh, Jules Harrell. Um, and there I learned um, methods of cardiovascular psychophysiology. Um, and learn you know, how to kind of measure heart function um, and, and in a more sophisticated way even than just taking someone's blood pressure. Okay? Um, we'll see some more of that work in just a moment here. Um, but when I got to UNC, I started out very basic um, and I just took folks' blood pressure and I said, let's just see how this thing plays out. Okay? So could we examine the protective effects of racial identity on the association between discrimination and blood pressure? Um, and, and would racial identity kind of, again, mitigate or act as a protective factor? Um, again, reading the disparities literature, it was very clear that their elevated rates of high blood pressure are a problem. 
Um, but few studies at that point had really looked at it in the context of physiological outcomes, looked at identity. Um, and so, again, could the same thing we found for psychological research extend? So, not surprisingly, we looked at discrimination, identity, um, and resting blood pressure. Okay. All right, so what did we find? Um, does racial identity moderate the relation between um, racial discrimination and blood pressure? Um, we found that yes, it did, though not in the ways that we expected necessarily. So um, here we did something a little extra. Let me add on a, another degree of um, complexity to the study. Um, we used person-centered analyses. So instead of just looking at centrality alone, um, just looking at something Sellers calls private regard, we kind of put all the dimensions of racial identity together and we came up with different profiles of racial identity, okay? And we looked at, these are cross-sectional data, um, how the link between discrimination and blood pressure um, would be the same or different, okay? Interestingly, there was no main effect uh, for racial discrimination in the entire sample. It wasn't until we factored in their racial identity profile that we saw different patterns in terms of the link between discrimination uh, and blood pressure, okay? So um, this one cluster um, that you see here, uh, there's the pointer, okay. Um, integrationist, uh, these were folks who um, kind of, um, you know, felt fairly positively about being African American, but they also valued um, humanist ideology, so they felt connected to other humans. Um, they reported high levels of assimilationist ideology, so they saw that blacks had something in common um, with other Americans. Um, that was our uh, integrationist cluster. And if you look at the line here, um, you'll see that that line uh, was not significant, or it looks like it's positive, but the, the slope is not significant, okay? Um, we had something we called um, race-focused optimists. So these were folks who were really high in centrality. They had strong levels of feeling like being black was important to who they are. They felt really positively um, about being African American. Um, and we call them optimists because they also reported feeling high in terms of like assimilationist. Um, so they saw a sense of connection to other Americans, et cetera. Okay? That line, um, as you'll see, also uh, looks like a positive slope here, but was not significantly different than zero, okay? So we've got two groups where um, it, it doesn't seem like um, there's an association, and in fact, one might argue um, that this could be demonstrating a protective pattern, because there's no link between uh, racial discrimination and uh, the uh, blood, blood pressure, um, diastolic blood pressure, sort of resting blood pressure. Um, where we got something that was a little bit of a surprise was uh, this low regard nationalist group. So the low regard nationalist group, these are folks who had low public regard. For those of you who are not familiar with the Sellers model, these are individuals who thought that other people did not see African Americans favorably. Okay? So in general, they thought um, people outside of the African American reference group did not see blacks in a, in a positive manner. Okay? Um, and nationalist ideology, um, so again, these were clusters or profiles. So these folks had low regard, this is a little bit misleading here, but they had not high nationalist um, ideology. So they thought that um, being black was a unique experience. Okay? Um, a number of studies that Rob Sellers and others did looking at discrimination and identity actually found that public regard, low public regard, was protective. Um, there's actually a study he pro uh, published with um, young adults and some folks of the School of Public Health here, uh, Mark Zimmerman, Cleo, and, and others, showing that nationalist ideology was protective. Okay? So when I did these analyses and found that if you look at the line here, um, this is a significant negative slope. And what we found was that blood pressure was actually decreasing 
um, for individuals um, in this group, in the low regard nationalist group, uh, I thought, wow, that's really interesting. So the more discrimination uh, these folks experience, um, their blood pressure is actually decreasing. It's actually uh, lower than um, at lower levels of discrimination. And so again, uh, consistent with sort of a protection profile, if you look at high levels of racial discrimination, the folks in the low regard nationalist have the lowest levels of diastolic blood pressure. Um, but what I think was most striking to me about these findings were that the group that showed this pattern was a group that had two sort of aspects that have been found to be protective in psychological uh, research. Okay? So why don't you chew on that for a little bit, but that was uh, the finding for the second study. Okay, all right, so one year later, um, we are continuing to think about how psychological factors like identity play a role in cardiovascular outcomes, cardiovascular disparities. And so I conducted a lab study um, where I had folks come in and imagine um, racism vignettes. We had about 200 youth that did this. Um, and we were measuring their heartbeat and what their heart rhythms were doing as they imagined these different racism vignettes, okay? And the premise of this study you know, I was sort of thinking a little bit out of the box here, but I said, I wonder if folks' internal kind of heart um, and, you know, sort of ways that they can't perceive are responding in different ways um, as a function of their racial identity, okay? Now, in those days, we've, we've progressed a little bit. Uh, it's a little bit harder to do or more complicated to get um, studies with um, actual in vivo racism through the IRB. Um, we've been able to do that in more recent years. But um, back then, we used racism analogs. And again, we, we worked through the vignettes. And I'm thinking maybe we'll have differential responses um, as a function of folks' racial identity, OK? Uh, what I expected, getting a little bit ahead of myself here, is that because racial identity had been a protective factor in mental health studies, um, I expected that if you, I'm imagining a racism vignette um, and I have a high level of racial centrality, uh, that I wouldn't really see an exaggerated physiological response, but that people who had low racial centrality um, in the same way that it acted as a vulnerability factor uh, for uh, psychological health, I would see people get really kind of activated um, and show a flight or fight response, if you will, okay? All right, so um, what we did was we employed a visual imagery paradigm, as I've already said, to get a sense of whether um, racial identity would act as a moderating factor, okay? So does racial identity modify autonomic nervous system reactivity? Um, to blatant and subtle discrimination, okay? So I'm kind of giving you layers here. Um, in our vignettes, not only did we um, kind of um, look at whether, you know, vary the perpetrator that people imagined, a black perpetrator or a white perpetrator, but we also varied in these different scenarios. This is a within subjects design whether the discrimination was kind of blatant in your face or subtle, okay? So is a officer kind of calling you the N-word, which we would use in the actual vignette, um, to your face, um, or is it the type of thing where you're standing in line at the post office and the uh, attendant calls the person uh, behind you and overlooks you in line? That was kind of more the subtle uh, manipulation. Uh, one of the reasons, and let me take a step back here, that I was interested in the autonomic nervous system is because if you go back to Clark and colleagues in their biopsychosocial model of racism, not only was he arguing this, but other people were arguing that maybe part of the reason that we see these health disparities is the exaggerated uh, kind of um, 
flight or fight response. And that over time, the allostatic load you know, kind of bears down, the system becomes dysregulated, it's no longer um, attuned to um, discrimination, and um, you know, it, there, there's kind of a breakdown, and that, that leads to health problems. Um, I thought this was a very interesting idea, but at the time I was looking at this, I thought I don't, I've not seen very much empirical evidence um, kind of showing that that's the actual mechanism um, by which this might operate. So I wanted to see for myself, even though these were vignettes, um, if we would actually see sympathetic nervous system activation. Okay, sympathetic nervous system, flight or fight, that's part of this autonomic nervous system response. Okay, so research had paid scant attention to the actual mechanisms. Uh, part of my thinking is also, if I really want to understand how racial identity operates and why it's a good thing, it would be good to kind of, maybe these physiological studies could tell us something. So if folks' heart rate kind of went through the roof when they were, you know, sort of had low racial centrality, maybe that would provide some clues as to what could be going on, okay? So, oops, <laughs> that's what we did. Um, does, you know, we're kind of thinking, um, does stress appraisal um, or coping mediate impact of racial identity on adjustment? Um, and so, again, this could provide some clues as to mechanisms. Um, we looked at racial identity and we looked at, um, that should say, cardiac pre-ejection periods. So these are two um, different aspects of the autonomic nervous system. Um, RSA is a measure of the parasympathetic or rest and digest system. Uh, I was a little bit less interested in RSA uh, because, again, the mechanisms um, that have been argued have been more kind of uh, sympathetic, and that's what PEP or cardiac pre-ejection period measures. Um, although I was more interested in pre-ejection period, I'll just mention in passing that dysregulated autonomic functioning, RSA, has been linked to um, a number of mental health and other self-regulation difficulties. Um, so it's also, maybe not in the context of the flight or fight response, an important system to pay attention to. Okay, but what do we find? Well, this really kind of blew my mind here. Uh, we found that, uh, I'll give you a quick primer in um, psychophysiology, what we're looking at here. So this is um, pre-ejection period. Uh, this is the flight or fight response. Um, below the sort of uh, axis here, this is sympathetic activation. So when there's a decrease in PEP, that means that the sympathetic nervous system is really kicking up, okay? Um, this pattern up here where you see there's an increase in milliseconds um, that actually means that the body's kind of mellowing out and relaxing a little bit, okay? If you look at the pattern, you'll notice that here's where the action is. For people who had high racial centrality, when they imagined the vignettes that had white actors um, in the scenario, um, they had a decrease in pre-ejection period, okay? Uh, this is remarkable because um, a, it's showing that there's sympathetic activation um, only when they're imagining um, the white actors and only for individuals who have high racial centrality, okay? Um, but it's remarkable because, and without going into a, a, a detailed psychophys lesson here, the sympathetic nervous system, when it activates, it's because the body is saying there's a threat here. Uh, there's something really wrong, and I better get ready, okay? Uh, before your sympathetic nervous system activates, um, your parasympathetic nervous system, kind of the rest and digest, which normally slows things down, it kind of pulls back a little bit, and that allows the heart rate to kind of go up a little bit. And then the body kind of assesses, okay, is this dangerous or not? And if it says, okay, this is not so bad, I got it, the heart rate will actually come back down, okay? If the body kind of looks and says, ooh, I think I'm in trouble here, that's when the sympathetic nervous system kicks in. So there's kind of a two-step process here. And what I'm basically saying to you is that 
in order to get to sympathetic activation like what we're seeing here, the body has to really think something is, is wrong and I'm in danger, okay? So um, this was interesting because, again, I expected that it would be people who had low racial centrality who would show this response, but we weren't even talking about a real incident of racism. We were just asking people to imagine um, scenarios that had white actors uh, and here the blatant subtle didn't matter any vignette where there was a white actor they showed this uh, activation okay um, okay so I'll leave you with that we all actually found a similar pattern <clears throat> for private regard um, so again individuals private regard this is how positively do I feel about being African-American individuals who said I feel really great I feel positively, I like being black. Notice the sympathetic activation here. So again, when they're imagining the scenarios with the white actors, um, they experience a high level of activation, okay? At the time, I, I was kind of more focused, I was like, wow, like, your racial identity is actually moderating how your internal body is responding to imagining um, a very specific type of scenario. Um, so I was more focused on that. I didn't think too much about what does it mean that individuals who have higher centrality and higher private regard, who feel positively about being African American, are showing this kind of sympathetic activation, this flight or fight. In the grand scheme of things, you know, maybe sympathetic activation, people have argued, is a good thing because if there is a threat, you want to be ready for it. Um, and so I kind of published the study, trying to get tenure, uh, and moved on about <laughs> my business, okay? <laughs> All right, so study four. I think this is the last one. Um, many, many years later, this is one of my students, Henry Willis, um, was interested and has been interested in anxiety disorders for a long time. And so he wanted to look at uh, racial identity um, as a protective factor in much the same way that we had done for um, anxiety and depressive symptoms in the context of OC symptoms, okay? There's actually some theoretical models you'll see in a second, um, work by Monica Williams at Connecticut, um, who argues that, um, you know, we really need a sort of sociocultural um, approach to thinking about um, OC development and anxiety disorders in, um, in the field, okay? You'll see the model in a second. Um, Henry was interested in looking at whether identity would operate as a protective factor, but by this time we had multiple waves of data. So it was not just a cross-sectional study. At the point, uh, I think these are with three waves of data that were collected about a year apart. Uh, he, um, you know, instead of just doing a snapshot study, looked at um, multiple uh, waves. All right, so again, the study looked at the associations between discrimination and um, anxiety distress with a particular focus on obsessive compulsive symptoms. Um, the questions have been pretty consistent throughout our research. Does identity moderate? Um, we also were interested in um, could it play um, a mediating role? I won't present those data. Um, and, and what are the mechanisms that influence the developmental trajectories um, of um, health, okay? Um, few studies had examined um, racial identity as a protective factor over time. I mentioned the 2004 study where I, you know, we had kind of measured uh, anxiety at the end of the year, but we didn't control for the initial levels of wave one uh, anxiety and psychological <laughs> factors, so we got that right this time. Um, and we also combined, uh, we used person-centered analyses again. Okay. Um, all right, Those, the study variables are not that exciting. <laughs> Discrimination, identity, and mental health symptoms. Now, at the time this study came along, um, I was playing around with the data uh, before Henry even asked these questions, and a very interesting finding uh, arose, okay? And that is that when I looked at these data using two waves of data, um, 
I sort of said, let me start with my basic question, my go-to question. Does racial centrality moderate the link between discrimination um, and changes in anxiety symptoms? And what we found, as you can see here, is that individuals who had high racial centrality um, actually had a very strong positive association between discrimination and increases in anxiety. So one year later, the individuals who had the highest racial centrality reported increased levels of anxiety distress. Okay? Um, this is not what we expected to find because we're thinking racial identity is a protective factor. Um, I looked at the data several times. I thought, did I code this uh, you know, wrong? Is there something going on here? How could this be the case? Um, individuals who had moderate and um, lower levels, uh, there was no association between discrimination. Okay, so hopefully you see where I'm going with this. The pattern is not at all consistent with what the 2004 study, and it made us stop and pause for a second. I didn't even want to publish anything showing this because I was afraid how the data would be uh, interpreted. Okay, um, okay so that's just a, a side note. Here's the model by um, Williams and John, uh, Monica Williams at UConn. Um, she's very expert in OCD, and um, she says, look, if we're really gonna think about <coughs> um, OCD symptoms and distress, uh, when we're talking about um, uh, the model, we've gotta think about a sociocultural approach. And so she says, we've gotta look at identity. There are a number of other things she says are important. Um, we've gotta look at perceived racism. And that part of the reason people may actually experience uh, OC symptoms is that over time, um, it leads to intrusive thoughts um, and people become anxious, okay? And obviously not everyone who experiences uh, racism um, experiences OCD uh, disorder, but um, maybe for those who do, there's something going on in here, okay? All right, so along we went, back to Henry's study now. Um, I didn't show racial profiles earlier, but this is what I was talking about. So these are a different set of data. Um, we have slightly different names for the clusters. You can see um, a black optimist group here. Again, notice these folks feel these are standardized scores, uh, feel pretty positively about being African American. Um, we call them optimists, though, because their assimilation score is almost one standard deviation above the mean. Um, if you look at the race focus group, um, notice that um, they are, you know, the ones that are above the mean, centrality and uh, kind of nationalist ideology. Um, and so we have one more cluster here, the humanist cluster. Look at their centrality score. They're really seeing themselves more in the sense of being human, okay? Um, they're not very focused. If you look at the score that's the highest above the mean, half a standard deviation, um, it's the humanist subscore, okay? So that's why we named it that. Again, so we thought, okay, <clears throat> I had kind of forgotten about the playing around with the data um, and that centrality led. I thought it was some fluke finding. Um, well, <clears throat> when we looked at the longitudinal data using three ways of data, uh, what we actually found was that the humanist group, so these are folks who saw themselves in terms of I'm human, Flatline, there's no association. Their OC symptoms did not increase um, over a, a two-year period. Um, but individuals who have this kind of um, black optimist or the race-focused ideology um, experienced an increase in OC symptom distress, okay? Um, again, longitudinal data, we controlled for wave one OC symptoms. Um, and we saw this increase, okay? So again, I, at this point I said, okay, this is not a fluke here. There's something else um, that must be operating, and why on earth are all of these data kind of at odds with the prevailing wisdom, which is that racial identity is a protective factor? <clears throat> okay, so that's the data. <laughs> um, How do we make sense of what may possibly be going on um, in this kind of arc of studies that I've just um, shared with you? Um, 
This is a bit not what I plan to do, but just really quickly, kind of, you'll see my ideas in a second about what may be going on. Any thoughts as to how you would understand the pattern um, in terms of what's going on? Yes, please. I just have a quick question. Yeah. Is that including black immigrants in the US, or is it similar? These are all individuals, college students, who identified as um, black. So we had some uh, Afro-Caribbean. There's some variation, but not a whole lot in the sample. I'm just curious, because um, I'm just thinking about whether the differences in the findings due to different demographic shifts, maybe, or? OK. No, they're, it's largely sim similar when you look at the demographics across. Yeah. Any other quick thoughts on what? could be how you would explain the difference in the findings? Well, it's occurring to me earlier when we started previewing this that um, a person who had a strong sense of racial identity, centrality, focus, um, might be cognitively primed to appraise racism in a more uh, powerful way. Okay. Um, that the, like what, you, what you put up as a situational factor, perceived racism, is actually directly connected to one's racial identity. So I was just, that's, that would be the hypothesis. Okay. Because if your data show that it's not an objective factor, at least the way you're measuring it. Right. Well, they're showing that in the context of some data, not others. So initially it does, and again, The other thought I had is the, the measure may not be capturing the full extent of the construct. I mean, if, if, if it's a powerful idea that having a, a, a positive sense of self related to one's race is protective, then it, that it must get you past that cognitive appraisal threat mm -hmm. somehow. Like, like you, 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 you see it as a resource, and you use it as a resource maybe for accessing other Okay. Okay. All right. Let me take one more, and then I'll show you what I think, what I'm thinking at the moment. I was kind of just thinking about the literature that talks about attribution, mm -hmm. um, especially for like centrality. And so I don't know anything about the relationship between um, attribution and anxiety. But I was kind of thinking that if you were, um, if you had high Racial identity was highly central to you, then when you're faced with discrimination, and you're able to sort of compartmentalize and dismiss um, this threat. And with the rumination of anxiety, that maybe there's some conflict there. Okay. So that maybe individuals who are high in racial centrality might um, sort of go down a path of kind of rumination that leads to, or they're thinking about it in a different way that leads to increased distress over time. To the okay, okay, okay. So it's excellent ideas. By the way, we haven't figured it out yet. We're trying to uh, sort of get an understanding. Uh, I think a lot of these ideas make sense. What's really striking to me, you know, I've just presented, um, you know, data to you from our lab over the last several years. The prevailing wisdom in the literature is that racial identity operates as a protective factor, okay? So uh, you'd be hard pressed to find many published studies showing it as a vulnerability factor. When you look at, I, so I wrote a grant uh, to try and understand this to NSF, which was funded last year. Um, and when I did my literature review, I was actually surprised to find that there are actually a number of studies showing uh, racial identity as a vulnerability factor, but it's oftentimes not African Americans. Um, so there are a number of studies with Asian Americans um, and also Latinx populations, um, young adults, that show this kind of similar pattern here. Um, I don't know what those mean yet, but I'm aware that that literature exists. Okay. All right, so a couple of things uh, we've been thinking about. Um, all right, so racial identity didn't always operate in the way um, that we expected it to. Um, one kind of place we started out was, um, is this kind of a, a methods artifact? Um, so some of the studies were longitudinal. Almost all of the studies showing it a protective factor are cross-sectional. And so we wondered if maybe Kintus, a little bit of what was said, 
um, how identity operates might play out in different ways. So maybe if we're looking at a physiological study in the moment, there's kind of this activation, um, but that maybe over, depending on the time frame, it might be protective kind of in the short term, um, but then <laughs> If we look at it farther out, um, over time, it might be playing out um, in, a, in, in a way that's not protective. So does the, does the timing matter? The methods that we used in these samples were very different. So um, for example, in the physiological study, we've got kind of moment to moment very quickly. Um, and then the longitudinal data are different than the, the, the cross-sectional study. So we're, we're kind of comparing um, apples and oranges here. Okay. The other thing when I did this literature review is that um, some people said maybe there needs to be a distinction um, between kind of different models of racial identity. So if we conceptualize identity as kind of stage models um, or kind of the content models, um, which is what um, Seller's model is, for example. It's about how central your race is to you, how you feel about you're going to get a different kind of feeling than process models, which talk about kind of searching for identity. And that if someone is searching for identity um, and kind of like, you know, reading books and all this stuff, and then they experience discrimination, that maybe um, differences in studies are a function of people in an active stage of exploration. And there have actually been some studies using Gene Finney's model of ethnic identity, where they find that when you're searching for identity, that exacerbates the link. Okay? That doesn't help our study out, because we didn't use the, the process uh, model. We used a content model, and we still found this pattern. So we'll table that. The one that I'm honing in on right now is um, context. Does the context matter? And I think this ties in what several uh, people were kind of guessing. So the NSF grant that we have right now, um, we've kind of argued that um, maybe the context matters in terms of how stressors are appraised. Um, when we tried to understand what might be going on, these data were collected at UNC, OK? Um, there's been a lot of stuff going on at UNC in the last several years, in case you haven't read the headlines. Um, Confederate statues, KKK on campus, um, renaming of buildings uh, that you know were names of KKK uh, leaders. Uh, this stuff is like it's it's constantly in the news. There's something new in the DTH, our our paper, um, every day. And so maybe if I am um, in someone who feels deeply about being African American, and that's a central part of my identity, and I'm in a context where there's constant, you know, kind of like thinking about these types of issues, that that might over time lead to some kind of activation and distress. So that's another idea. And so the NSF grant that we're doing right now, uh, we're collecting data at a predominantly white institution and also at Howard University, okay? And we're arguing that um, we're not going to see the same patterns of identity protection or vulnerability at Howard that we would see because the context is different, if this context idea kind of plays out. Um, and so um, there have been a number of scholars who have argued that, again, um, people's ability, uh, basically the, the context matters in terms of who's around. Okay. Um, the perceived threat idea is one that we haven't um, sort of detailed um, examined very closely yet, but it's one of the models that um, uh, Williams and Muhammad actually mentioned in terms of what could actually happen. Um, appraisal did come up in terms of how, what people think might be going on, but how people who have high racial centrality um, kind of appraise their environment or their surroundings, maybe attributions, may play a role in what happens afterwards. Is it rumination? Is it um, distress? Um, so on and so forth. So maybe people who have high racial centrality um, are appraising or perceiving greater threat. That's certainly what the psychophysiological data um, seem to suggest in the analog study. Okay. This presents an interesting conundrum, and it's kind of where I'll end just about. <clears throat> 
And that is, what do we do with this? Okay, so again, the prevailing wisdom is that racial centrality, racial identity is great. We want to foster um, racial centrality um, in children and youth. But if it is the case that it's heightening um, folks' kind of perceived threat or activation, what then? What do you do uh, in terms of an intervention? Okay, there have been a number of recent scholars who are trying, Ariana Umana Taylor at Harvard um, recently published some data on an ethnic identity intervention. Um, if it is, in fact, sort of raising distress and levels of uh, perceived threat, how do we, what, what do we do with that is a question that I'm kind of grappling with now. Love to hear your thoughts. Um, I have a question here about whether hypervigilance um, and sort of perception should be a threat. We could use mindfulness, you know, clinical psychologists. Could we use mindfulness to think about how people kind of perceive these sorts of things? Um, one idea that we had in terms of what may be going on is um, that in the context of these events, maybe hypervigilance mediates um, the link between racial identity and negative psychological distress, okay? So these are preliminary data. We haven't published them yet. But what I did is I took a quick look. I took three waves of the data, just focusing on racial centrality. And I looked at hypervigilance using David Williams' measure, hypervigilance scale, as a mediator. And then I looked at um, kind of reports of negative mood at wave three, okay? As you can see, we control for all the prior levels here. Uh, we found a significant indirect effect between racial centrality and negative mood, okay? So individuals who at wave one, this is as first year students, reported being black, oops, <laughs> is really important to who I am. At wave two, a year later, they reported increased levels of hypervigilance, okay? For those of you who are not familiar with David's scale, uh, it's things like, I kind of um, pay attention to where I'm going. I think about what's going to happen before I leave the house. I kind of worry that an incident of racism might occur if I go you know, this place or that place. Um, and then higher vigilance at time two was related to increased negative mood or dysphoric mood at wave three a year later, even when controlling for prior levels of uh, mood. Okay, So what this suggests here is that a potential pathway of understanding what may be going on is that, again, the appraisal, kind of the way that folks are perceiving the context, um, again, racial centrality, being black really central to my identity, uh, leads me to kind of be a little bit more on guard, and that over time this may have implications for um, psychological mood and psychological distress. Another really concerning finding, um, but begs the question of, what would we do with these data? What would you, you know, think are appropriate intervention if these pan out um, in other contexts? Okay, so I'm gonna skip that and just go to my conclusion, uh, which is that to reduce the health effects of racism among African American and other youth who are experiencing marginalization, um, it's critical that we really understand how identity, how the significance and meaning of race um, that youth ascribe to their identities shape their psychological well-beings. I think we have to get this right. If, in fact, there are contexts where raising people or heightening racial identity kind of leads to greater vigilance, um, is that something we should be concerned about? Um, and then finally here, just a general statement about um, psychological constructs like racial and ethnic identity can be important parts of solutions in terms of addressing uh, racial health and wealth disparities and their effects on health. So a lot of times I hear people who are dismissive um, of psychologists and ask what can psychologists contribute um, to questions of race health uh, disparities. Um, I would argue from these and other data that this appraisal process and really thinking about the cognitive piece is something that other scholars um, do not do as well as psychologists do. And so we need to put our heads together to really think about um, how the cognitive and individual level factors play important mediating process in these 
things that may have implications for large public, public health interventions. Okay, so that's it. Um, I just want to acknowledge a couple of collaborators on the uh, papers, some funders of our work, um, and thank you for your time and attention. So, other thoughts, questions, reactions? Dr. Bowman. Could you go back a few slides to the one where. Uh, the vigilance one? Yeah, where you raised the questions about. Uh, you, you raised questions for uh, this one? That, that one? Okay. You know, I think uh, it's interesting too, that the evolution of uh, work around racial identity, as you indicated, you know, that was the departure between the process of the content models. Uh, and. Um, uh, one of the things that also, at that juncture, is people begin to reduce their attention to racial identity, uh, and they tended to, uh, what should I say, kind of depart from considerations of how racial identity uh, contracted with racial consciousness. Mm -hmm. and, and that was not the same kind of development of, the, of that related construct. Mm -hmm. And I think that idea is kind of a, implicit in the discussion of process which is content issues, you know, for example, the encounter stage mm -hmm. is the issue where racial consciousness is 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 is, is in such a part of that part of that process. Likewise, when you think about the context, a lot of the issues that you've kind of raised around context is really about how people are making sense of the context mm -hmm. uh, who may be racially salient mm -hmm. in terms of their attitude toward their input. You know, but in addition, they're making appraisals about the context mm -hmm. uh, or race related appraisals mm -hmm. of the context, which is as a racial consciousness element to, to that kind of discussion as well. And certainly the kind of uh, uh, appraisals of, of key threat, uh, you know, the kind of attributions that people make, you know, uh, with regard to uh, uh, kind of discontent, you know, not so much attitudes about the end group, but of uh, appraisals of the relationship between the in-group and the dominant group, mm -hmm. uh, and discontent. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the consciousness construct. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and, uh, it's, it, and that kind of uh, process uh, plays out very heavily when you talk about the uh, hyper you know, it, 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 it's, it's people's consciousness of the threats in the environment or in the climate. You know, so I think there's that thread that kind of runs through it that really, uh, I think, raises the question about really looking at good metrics to consider not only racial identity, but also but how racial identity operates in combination with racial consciousness. consciousness. Okay. And but we have a, we don't have the same kind of conceptual development of that. Yeah. Nor needed measures to specify it. Right. You know, but I do think it's it, 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 it's sort of implicated in your discussion of those various. A, a plausible hypothesis about what might be going on. Okay, and I also think maybe um, consciousness. I have seen some recent new measures. I'm not super familiar with them. Right, but I think they're evolving. Yes. In a very uneven way. Right. And, and even when they read the concept, the metrics are very disparate. Disparate. disparate yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I, but I think the the, the 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 concept itself, you know, and the degree to which we all understood the racial identity and racial consciousness are, are, are kind of interesting ways of making sense out of race. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one with regard to the in-group, other one with regard to the relationship between the in-group and the and out mm -hmm. You know, and discontent yep. about any politics, yep. which, which by definition implicates the context. Right. You know, but I think, it, 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 you know, and, and I, I, I too have seen this uneven reference to racial consciousness in literature, but, you know, the, the theorizing, the conceptualizing, the theorizing, and the measurement is extremely, uh, uh, what should I say, uh, underdeveloped in contrast to, to the, the racial community. identity. Yeah. Okay. And it kind of departed from that early, early, early work. I think you do see some of it implicated in the process model when they think about the encounter stage. Okay. You know, you, you know that yes. that work implicates, you know, racial conscious type ideas. Yes. But I think that's that's uh, about as close as it gets. Otherwise, it's very sporadic. Right. You know, in the which in the way in which it gets about. But I think it is a theme that you've implicated in your kind of plausible hypothesis. You know about the certainty of um, 
um, around process content, does context matter, how appraisals work, and the, how the stuff come together in interventions as well. So you might kind of just, 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 just think about that. that the kind, okay. Uh, to consider going forward. Okay. Something I didn't develop that's separate from this, I thank you for that comment, um, is um, there's a paper by Tiffany Yip um, where she wrote about racial identity, not consciousness, as a double-edged sword. Um, and the fact that, you know, when I first started digesting these data, I was thinking like, wow, here's something that we know, I really believe is protective in particular contexts. Um, but it also may be influencing, particularly in contexts where there's a high level of, um, you know, sort of salience of these types of things, leading to greater negative mood and, and vigilance. And so, um, that's just I'm just thinking something I didn't mention during the talk, not related to your comment, yeah, but because you know, basically the, the fundamental difference is you know, any identity issue has to do with uh, those appraisals mm -hmm. of one's self or one's group, mm -hmm. those attitudes. You know, of, uh, of positive appraisals of one's input. Whereas the consciousness literature, broadly speaking, is you know, the related appraisals of relationships of the, and discontent even, mm -hmm. over uh, the inequality or the injustices or the iniquities between your in group and out group, which, 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 uh, or the dominant group, which, which automatically begins to prime issues of, of, of vigilance or context, or um, attribution, mm -hmm. all of those things become very, very central in the uh, consciousness construct. Mm -hmm. You know, because you're really looking, you're, looking, you're, you're making the phrases less of just your uh, intern, your uh, internal uh, orientations towards your in-group, but you're really looking much more with regard to your in-group in context. Mm -hmm. Your in-group in context. Uh, and, that, and when you think about race, you know, it, 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 you, you know, no way people can have concerns about the identity in context, but also having to negotiate, you know, what that means in terms of being with, with, the, with the, the context and the outlook mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. We kind of limit our, our conceptualizing and theorizing to the, to, to the orientation toward England, you know, without really being, you know, thinking about how that comes to bear in our appraisals for the relationship between that thing and the system, so to speak. Right. The the right. Which, which is where the consciousness comes from. It's a piece. You know, but we, you know, it's just interesting that the departure of the we're working on the process of the country model where that remains undeveloped. Okay. Thank you. Meredith, did you? great question. I mean, we have measured skin tone. I have not, um, as many scholars, um, paid a lot of attention to it. Uh, I, you know, um, I would argue that it would be something worth kind of taking a look at to see how that might be influencing um, kind of these reactions and whether there are differences as a function of skin tone. You know, skin tone is very difficult to measure <laughs> accurately. Uh, we have kind of self-report. Um, so, this so might have to take it too seriously, but you know, I, I do think uh, that might be worth paying attention to. So, thank you for that suggestion. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, towards the end, uh, I feel like the implication is really that this negative is a bad outcome or necessarily something, or something to be avoided. But I'm kind of wondering if it should be more be considered just a cost. Because a cost? Yeah. Okay. With vigilance, like the I, I avoid certain spaces, etc. And you're talking about um, the occurrences at the like it reminds me of the 
ideas within visual lens are about it being like presented as a maladaptive stress, but it might be perfectly appropriate to be more vigilant um, and also to to use this in that context. And then maybe it does have these trade-offs later on for like chronic long-term health. But very, very appropriate in that moment of like I do need to think about the record of what you're saying. Yeah. I, I think that um there certainly are contexts where vigilance is a good thing and it's, it, it's good to have it. You get in trouble if you're not vigilant. I think what's far more concerning to me is to see, you know, kind of nine or ten months later, um, this clear link with um, negative mood or negative affect, which we know is a, a strong precursor to a number of substance use and, um, you know, a number of other mental health difficulties. So um, I'm okay with increases vigilance and we're not seeing downstream negative mental health effects, um, but that's the, the kind of piece that I worry about. Yeah. Uh, so I ignored this side of the room. Anyone have thoughts over here? Yes. Yeah, so I've been doing a lot of thinking about how integration of MD works as a motor factor in youth in schools and in their decision to um, engage in health compromising behaviors, and I'm wondering if the same mechanisms that are at work there might also apply to how they are reacting with stress. So I've been thinking a lot about um, the importance of, of having a positive self-concept, but also the journey of getting there. Mm -hmm. So sort of um, negotiating and developing the, your, the ideas about what it means to be a member of your ethnic group. I think that that process and, the, and getting to engage in that process in a healthy manner might also be involved somehow when you're um, engaging in, in that, um, that's, what's it called, the visionary? The hypervision? No, oh, no, no, the, vi the vignettes, yeah, the, the racism. Vignette, yeah. The way you um, sort of engage in, in like theory of mind perspective taken and how, so not just the positive the concept, but also like the journey, the, the process of like negotiating those ideas might also be implemented in how they um, appraise and like give meaning to different scenarios. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think that's an interesting idea. One thing it makes me think about is that um, in these models, we're kind of treating racial identity as a, as a static construct. And um, we know that during this period of life, we actually have uh, some data we're under review right now um, that show even with Robert Sellers dimensions which he argued are stable, um, you see fluctuations um, and changes um, in these patterns. So in all of these studies I'm talking about, we've kind of modeled identity as kind of like a one-time kind of static thing. And your, your comment makes me think about paying attention more to the process and whether the relationships might even be different if you're looking at how changes in identity relate to changes in um, kind of the psychological constructs, which we can look at with with um, longitudinal data. Um, that has not been done yet. Um, I think your point also speaks to how we measure racial identity. Uh, one of the things I talk about in the special issue that just came out is like we're still using these kind of ways of thinking about identity that were great at the time, but identity has changed a lot since you know, the 90s when those measures were developed. And so there's a lot of stuff going on when you think about the context, where the process that you're talking about might look very different now, or maybe it doesn't, I don't know, in terms of how kids think about identity um, and how, you know, it changes over time. But again, in the absence of kind of longitudinal um, kind of measures that look at things changing over time and kind of the process, it's hard to get at that and in the st statistical models that we use most commonly, we don't often do that the way that you're talking about. Yeah. Thanks for the comment. Yes, please. Great talk. Thank you. Um, I've been starting to do some work. I, I do the level work, and I've been starting to do some work looking at race differences and appraisal uh, at the top level. And the health and retirement study actually asked parents to Respondents are exposed to a certain number of stressors, but then ask how upset they are by each individual type of stressor. And our racial minorities are saying they're less upset across all of these 
exposure to, mm -hmm. to lights. Mm -hmm. And that that appraisal is actually better capturing the effects on mental health than an exposure. Like if you're just taking a count of exposure versus a count of how stressful somebody thinks or how upsetting the stressor is, this appraisal measure seems to be doing more accurately predicting what it, how it manifests for mental health outcomes. Mm -hmm. But there's this real limitation in thinking about how we measure, like how, if you're just asking somebody how upset they are, like there's a couple of stressors where, especially like foreign born Latinos and Blacks, they think that caregiving is not a stress. They're saying, I'm not upset by this stressor at all. Mm -hmm. And if we're just asking how upset we are, do we think we're actually capturing like an appraisal of the stressor? Or how do you, do you have any ideas about how you're capturing this appraisal or threat yeah, it's tricky. It's tricky how to get at the appraisal. Um, I think it's an important construct to pay attention to. One of the reasons I like the psychophys is that it gives us some insight into. I mean, psychophys is about using physiological changes to understand the underlying psychological process, and so. On the one hand, seeing these changes in physiology can give us hints as to what may be going on. But the flip side of that is that unless you ask a question like, you know, how much are you bothered or upset by this, it's hard to map it onto. And then that self-perception may be, we, you don't know how accurate that is. So you, it's kind of a circular loop. <laughs> you have to think about how to get around that. And I haven't done that yet, so. <laughs> And there's no identity, there's no racial identity measures in the HRS2. Is another confident, yeah. 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 Hoping to change that at some point in the near future. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to let that be the last question. Uh, if, uh, we'll be here for another 10 minutes or so. So if you have any individual questions, please come up. And again, I just want to thank Dr. Nepper for a great uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you.